tonight. One student dead as troops rescue five others and a teacher kidnapped from the federal government college in Benin Yauri, Kebi State. Search for other victims continue. Death toll in yesterday night's gas tanker explosion on Mobalaji Bank Anthony Way in Lagos rises to five as victims count losses. Federal High Court dismisses suits challenging the three-month tenure extension of the immediate past Inspector General of Police, says President can exercise such power pending a new appointment. And the European Union suffers setback in legal battle to force drug maker AstraZeneca to supply 120 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine by end of June. Plus, business sports news from Abuja and later international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, federal government set to assess viability of over 100 projects suitable for public-private partnership. On sports news tonight, the federal government appoints former Super Eagle skipper John Mikelobi as youth ambassador to inspire young Nigerians to strive for excellence. And from Abuja, the president deplores destruction of critical national assets by vandals, says his directive for protection of the public infrastructure remains. We begin from Kebi State, where four of the abducted students of the federal government college, Beni Yawuri, in Kebi State, and one of their teachers have been rescued by the military. Unfortunately, one other student died. The deputy force commander of the Joint Task Force in the Northwest Zone, Air Commodore Abubakar Abdul Qadir, says the troops came in contact with the bandits in the early hours of today and engaged them in a gun duel, which forced them to abandon the five students and a teacher. A yet to be confirmed number of students and some teachers were abducted by the bandits who raided the college in their numbers yesterday morning. Air Commodore Abdul Qadir also spoke on an operation that led to the interception of 11 trucks of rustled cows in Zamfara estate. What happened was um, we got information about animals being rustled. And uh, for about five days now, we've been tracking these animals. And uh, we wanted to see eventually where these animals are going to end. And then they finally ended in, the, in a market called Antasha. And that was where the animals were finally sold uh, to those that bought them. Um, we've instructed our troops. Uh, to lay ambush for those animals and eventually last night the 11 trucks came into uh, the location where our troops were and uh, they finally picked them and brought them down here. As you all know we are covering four states, Sokota, KB, Zamfara and Kasena and we cannot have troops in all the villages in these places but all the hotspots we've made sure we have deployments in those places. Uh, in the last few days, we have stopped quite a lot of attacks in some of these villages. With the support of the Air Force from uh, Air Component from Casina, we have been able to stop a lot of attacks. I wouldn't want to say much, but uh, in the last few hours, we've come across the kidnappers. Uh, they came to our blocking point, and um, we've engaged them uh, early hours of this morning. Uh, at that point, we have, they have abandoned five of the students and one of the teachers. Unfortunately, I think we've lost one of the, uh, one of the students in such attack. But let me not say more than this at this point. Meanwhile, Kebi State Governor Abubakar Bagudu has also visited the federal government college Beni Yauri, where the abduction happened. The governor told the residents of the community and parents of uh, the abducted children that the state government is working with the federal government to ensure that such an incident does not reoccur in the state. Governor Bagudu says an end is already in sight to the menace of kidnapping in the northern part of the country. 
Well, staying with the abduction, a former governor of Kebi State and senator representing Kebi Central in the National Assembly, Senator Adamo Aliero, has been speaking on the incident. And he says the bandits who carried out the abduction are mostly non-Nigerians and were heavily armed with sophisticated weapons. Senator Aliero explains that the fear of collateral damage in the pursuit of the bandits hampered the rescue efforts by the military. He says the bandits are very much within the forest as they have terrorized the areas for several weeks. Senator Aliero was a guest on politics today. The, the bandits are still around that area because I understand that uh, the area has been cordoned off by the security forces. And uh, there was area surveillance uh, by the Air Force. Uh, they are using aircraft to locate where they are and they are communicating to the ground troops. And uh, all hands are on deck to ensure that uh, the remaining students are released and harmed. And uh, already the bandits have abandoned over 800 cows they, they stole from uh, various communities. Uh, as you would actually have, they were in the area for about four days. And they went to, from one village to another, uh, driving away all the animals they saw in the villages with them. And they had over 800 cows, so many goats, so many uh, rams. And because of the uh, cordon, cordon off of the area, they have abandoned these cows and they are running for their daily life. They are trying to escape. But the, the security forces uh, are after them. They okay. are running after them and uh, they are not going to allow them to escape. The only thing is that... Uh, they have to be very careful so that there will not be collateral damage. Meanwhile, unconfirmed reports reaching us has it that over 150 of the bandits may have been killed in a face-off with the military. Uh, sources say bodies of the bandits have been seen littered around the forest with their motorcycles. Channel Television reached out to the Kebi State Police Command Public Relations Officer to verify this information, but he has promised to get back to us as soon as possible. Military authorities have also not said anything about the incident. In Lagos, the death toll from last night's tanker explosion that spread to the premises of the Ogun State Property Investment Company on Mobilaji Bank Anthony Way has risen to five. The fire was caused by a leakage from a tanker laden with LPG, which spread to the OPIC premises beside Sheraton Hotel. Safety officials say three died on the spot, while two more people died this morning. About 25 vehicles were burnt during the incident. Our correspondent, Bukolaju Kintubi, reports. The OPIC Plaza Mobology Bank Anthony Way in Ikeja is scundered up, but the compound is littered with burnt vehicles. An aftermath of an LPG tanker explosion. Business owners at the base of the building are eager to commence business, but authorities here say the complex is sealed. While the LPG tanker exploded outside the building, the wind direction is said to be responsible for the destruction as an operating Chinese restaurant took the brunt of the fire because it also had gas in storage owing to the nature of their business. We found out that the tanker, it was claimed it had problem with the valve while it was moving. And the valve got separated from the tanker. So definitely all the product we escaped. So it filled the air. Whether the fire started from the highway due to the vehicle's activity or the fire started from here, that we can't establish. There are a lot of uh, permutations about that. Three dead bodies were recovered, and they are all staff of the Chinese restaurants, including their Nigerian manager who are recovered dead this morning. Why yesterday, 13 people were rescued alive with various degree of bones. The truck was out there, was going on the road, had a problem, had leakages, and then it got to a point just before Sheraton there, um, the back section and the front section got uh, disconnected. So the valves and all, you know, gas just started pewing out. And, you know, the gas was now coming windward, you know, into the building. And uh, before you know it, it had already reached the restaurant and um, the, the explosion of the 
tanks, the gas tanks outside, you know, that was taking gas in, into the building, exploded. The first one exploded, second one started leaking. Uh, the explosion actually threw fire into the service area at the back where you have the generators. And then, of course, you know, diesel and all that also started. Uh, uh, so all the cars you see out here, the gas that came into the building threw fire back at them. Before the building is open again to business, a Lagos state agency will have to conduct an integrity test to determine the strength of the building. From the OPIC Plaza in Ikeja, Bukola Jo Okitumbi, Channels Television News. And to legal matters where the Federal High Court has dismissed a suit challenging the legality of the three-month tenure extension which President Muhammadu Buhari granted to the immediate past Inspector General of Police, Mr. Mohamed Adamu, delivering judgment in the suit filed by a constitutional lawyer, Mr. Maxwell Opara. The trial judge, Justice Ahmed Mohamed, held that the President, who is vested with the constitutional powers to appoint an IGP in consultation with the Police Service Commission, also has the power to extend the tenure pending when a substantial appointment is made to fill the vacuum. The presiding judge, Justice Ahmed Mohammed, explains that the plaintiff fails to prove that the president has no power to extend the tenure of the former IGP, Mr. Mohammed Adamu, for three months. Maxwell Opara had in his suit contended that by virtue of Section 215 of the 1999 Constitution and Section 7 of the Nigeria Police Act 2020, Mr. Adamu could not validly continue to function as the Inspector General of Police, having a Attained the maximum 35 years in service on February 1, 2021. But he got a three month extension from President Muhammad Al Buhari. The plaintiff wants the court to declare the action of the president as illegal and unconstitutional. However, the court says otherwise. We totally disagree with the decision of uh, the court that uh, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is silent on the appointment and the procedure of appointment of, uh, of the Inspector General of Police. The, the court was, to our mind, wrong to have glossed over the issue, the specific requirements of the Constitution that a person to be appointed to that office must be a serving police officer. The court did not make any pronouncements on this. But the defendant insists that the judgment is fair. The trial court dealt with the matter the right way that we expected. The trial court stated emphatically that the plaintiff failed woefully to prove their case and in the end dismissed the case. So that was the decision of the, of the trial court. So, yes. So the, the, the case of the plaintiff was dismissed because the plaintiff failed to prove their case and that. Uh, the president has the power to extend the tenure of an inspector general of police pending the period for the appointment of a substantive inspector general of police. Nevertheless, the plaintiff plans to appeal the judgment in spite of the appointment of a new inspector general of police on April 6, 2021. Meanwhile, a federal high court sitting in Lagos has acquitted and discharged the senator representing Dalton North Senatorial District, Senator Peter Amoboshi, on allegations of laundering 322 million naira. Justice Chukujeku Aneke held that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, failed to prove the elements of the offences against the lawmaker. The judge also cleared Amoboshi's two firms, Golden Torch Construction Project Limited and Swimming Electrical Limited. Justice Aneke held, among other things, that the EFCC's case collapsed because bank officials were not called to testify and prove the money laundering charge. Senator Mwobushi, a People's Democratic Party chief chain representing Delta North, was arraigned alongside his companies in 2018 before Justice Mohamed Idris, who was later elevated to the Court of Appeal. This necessitated a rearrangement before Justice Aneke in October of 2018. The case today was thrown out. He was uh, discharged and acquitted, and so were the two other defendants. The two other defendants were companies uh, that he had interest in. All of them were discharged and acquitted, and the court ordered that the property, Guinea House in Marimuda Papa, be released to him. 
that property had been held by his, uh, EFCC un unlawfully. And after the proceedings, the courts made a finding that the action of EFCC was in law wrong and the properties were released to the senator and to the companies. In part two after the break, Senate plans new law to regulate the nation's power sector and eliminate conflict between the Nigeria Electricity Management Services Agency and the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. One student dead as troops rescue all kidnapped from the Federal Government College in Beni Yawuri, Kebi State. Death toll in yesterday night's gas tanker explosion on Mobileji Bank Anthony Way in Lagos rises to five as victims count losses. Federal High Court dismisses you challenging the three-month tenure extension of the immediate past Inspector General of Police, says President can exercise such power pending a new appointment. And the European Union suffers setback in legal battle to force drug maker AstraZeneca to supply 120 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine by end of June. Moving on, the Senate is considering the introduction of a law to govern the operations of the power sector in the country. The chairman of the Senate Committee on Power, Senator Gabriel Soswam, explains that a comprehensive electricity act was being worked on and would be out towards the end of this year or the first quarter of 2022. He was speaking during a roundtable on the enforcement of standards and regulations in the power sector. And I believe... This roundtable is organized by the Nigeria Electricity Management Services Agency to enlighten the lawmakers and judicial officers on the roles and responsibilities of the agency in Nigeria's power sector. The agency is concerned that there has been conflict between the mandates of NEMSA and the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. However, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Power explains how the proposed electricity bill will address the issue, among others, in the sector. We are putting out a comprehensive electricity act that clearly spells out what the functions of NEMSA, NEC are in that electricity act. So that when it comes before it, for interpretation before any of the judges, there is no ambiguity in what she or he is interpreting. And so on the legislative side, uh, that I think uh, is what uh, we are doing in order to assist the development of the power sector uh, in our country. The proposed bill which has killed the first reading in the Senate is expected to cover all sectors of the power industry. It's been observed that NEMSA has not positively uh, affected in the distribution, in, in, assisted in, in carrying out this function because there has been lack of enlightenment, because of lack of knowledge from the side of, of, of the general public, being that the law itself is new, the agency is new, and um, not many people are aware that this agency exists and this should be done. Reforming has a timeline, and so they now need to put an act together, and they said they are looking critically into the... Uh, electricity are for the country that would define rules of if every agency is an operator within that and it actually we heard it told you they are looking at the Indian model, they are looking at the Brazil model, they are looking at the Jap Japanese model. All this is just to ensure that when the electricity act comes out, everybody will have complete and distinct uh, rules to play. The Senate is hoping to commence the second reading as soon as possible and the final passage by the end of the year or the first quarter of next year. 
The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees is calling for a continuous inclusion of refugees, asylum seekers and internally displaced persons in health systems, schools and sports in West Africa. The country representative of the agency, Chan Sekapaya, says there is a huge number of people who are continually in dire need of humanitarian assistance due to rising insecurity and violent conflict around the world. According to the agency, there are currently an estimated 82.4 million people globally who are displaced from their ancestral homes. The week-long activities to mark the 2021 World Refugee Day gradually comes to an end with this news conference to highlight the plight of refugees, asylum seekers and internally displaced persons. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, there are 82.4 million people forcibly displaced by violence and persecution globally. 26.4 million of this population are refugees, while 48 million are internally displaced. 4.1 million are asylum seekers. The situation is now getting worse due to rising cases of violent conflicts and insecurity around the world. At the end of May 2021, NCFRMI with the support of UNHCR, registered 66,899 refugees from Cameroon and 4,500 refugees from 33 different countries, different nationalities, residing in 25 different states in urban areas, bringing the total number of refugees in Nigeria to 72,999. I wish to call on all for continued inclusion of refugees in health systems, schools and sports in Nigeria. Nigeria hosts 70,899 refugees from 34 nationalities. This is besides the estimated 2.9 million internally displaced persons the government is struggling to cater for. There is a thin line between refugees and internally displaced persons. Why statistics have shown that we have a total of 71,400 refugees in Nigeria of this number, 710 are in Abuja. We are, however, burdened more by the challenge of internally displaced persons. Statistics on this show that in Abuja alone, we have over 26,000 internally displaced persons. The signing of this document by the FCT administration is a declaration of Abuja as a city for refugees, which officials say is a reinforcement of the commitment of the federal government to improving the plight of refugees, asylum seekers and internally displaced persons in the country. Moving on to other stories, Lagos State Governor Babajide Sawonlu has inaugurated four newly reconstructed major roads in the Etiosa local government area of the state. The newly reconstructed roads are Milverton, Thompson, McDonald and Latif Jakonde Road. Governor Sawonlu says the infrastructure is expected to drive down traffic time in the state. The media space has been awash lately with calls for infrastructure development across the country, raising the need for government, both at state and federal levels, to do more. In Lagos State, the governor, Babajide Sowolu, is heeding the call. The latest project is located in Ikoi as residents around Milverton, Thompson, McDonald and Latif Jaconde roads have received a long-awaited facelift and reconstruction along the axis. It's with great pleasure that I heartily welcome you all to the former Commission of Rehabilitated Upgraded Networks of Roads in Etiosa, local government area. The rehabilitated and Upgraded Network of Roads is the gateway to the biggest job creation zone in Nigeria and home to Africa's most valued real estate businesses. Ikoi, as you well know, is the strategic property capital of Lagos and should not be left behind the Sonwolu's administration's urban regeneration effort and to develop a robust infrastructure portfolio across the length and breadth of the state. This summer commission is therefore in line with the decisions resolved to regenerate and connect more communities with sustainable roads in tandem with the team's agenda. It is expected that reconstruction of these four linked roads with their well-constructed drainage channels will reduce traffic time, eradicate water logging, and reduce car maintenance costs for road users. We can begin to see 
that the greater Lagos that we promise, the greater Lagos that we envision, begin to happen. And we're not doing this only in Ikoi or in Obalindi area. We're doing the same regeneration in Ekwe. We're doing the same thing in Badagri. We're doing network of roads in Alimosho. We're doing the greatest roads that are giving them problem in Ojo. We're currently doing them. We're doing similar things in Badagri. We're touching lives and doing new roads in Lagos Island. We're not leaving GRA Ikeja. We're not leaving it behind. Our people in Koshofe are feeling new roads that are coming in there. And so you can see that there is no part of our city, there is no part of this great city called Lagos that we are living untouched. So to the glory of God, we just unveil... With this commissioning, the Lagos State Government hopes to open a new vista of improved road infrastructure across the state. When the news at 10 returns, the president deplores destruction of critical national assets by vandals. Please stay with us. Welcome back and back to our earlier breaking story of the night of the Kebi State uh, FGC kidnap update. We understand that the state government is saying that some of the students and teachers have been uh, recovered, uh, that is rescued by military uh, authorities. And they're saying that some and not all of the students and teachers, uh, the governor was speaking to residents of the community and parents. Uh, he said the state government is working with the federal government to ensure that such an incident does not reoccur in the state. We'll continue to bring you more updates on that story as soon as we get them. Now back to the Mobology Bank Anthony fire incident in Lagos. Governor Dakwa Biodong of Ogun State has visited the scene and wants relevant regulatory agencies in the petroleum industry to ensure that trucks used to transport petroleum products are safe and secure to reduce avoidable deaths recorded from time to time from explosions across the country. He commiserates with the families of those who lost their lives in the inferno and it says that synergy would be initiated by governments of Ogun and Lagos states to ensure safety of life and property. We we'll continue to pray for those that have, the soul of those that have departed in this very unfortunate incident. There are definitely lessons to be learned from this incident. A truck, an LPG truck, breaks down on the highway. And the first thing is to begin to look at all these trucks carrying petroleum products. How can we ensure that they are safe on our roads? Can you imagine if this incident happened while this truck was in traffic? In rush hour traffic. Can you imagine the level of damage and casualty? So I was talking to the DJ Yasema, that we must sit down and think through how we can mitigate against the future occurrence of incidences like this. This must not be allowed to happen again. So we must sit down with the members of the Department of Petroleum Resources to determine how we can introduce extra safety measures. Yes. We have more stories now. Let's go over to our Buddha studios. Gloria Mozoke is standing by. Hello, Gloria. Millicent, good to see you. The president has issued a directive for the protection of critical national infrastructure against vandalism. President Muhammadu Buhari stated this today when he met with the management of one of the nation's telecoms companies, where he also lamented the impact of vandalism on growth of the digital economy sector. President Buhari says he is delighted that the information and communications technology sector is doing very well in spite of the global economic downturn. 
We have identified and addressed key challenges that affected the growth of the digital economy sector. One of such challenges was the high right of work costs, and another was the vandalization of critical national infrastructure. I am happy to know that the right of way charges have now been pegged at a maximum of 145 naira per linear meter, and I have given directives for the protection of critical national infrastructure, and this has addressed the issue of vandalization of such infrastructure. Service providers should always appreciate the effort of government and not undermine it. The information and communication technology sector was the fastest growing sector in both the fourth quarter of 2020 and the entire year 2020, based on the report by the National Bureau of Statistics. The sector's 14.7% double-digit growth rate played a principal role in supporting our country to exit the recession triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, the president is expected to participate in the 59th ordinary session of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government in Accra, Ghana, tomorrow. President Mohamed Buhari is expected to depart the nation's capital, Abuja, on Saturday for the mid-year statutory meeting of the regional bloc, with the exception of Mali, which was recently suspended from the group. Former President Goodluck Jonathan, who is ECOWAS special envoy and mediator to Mali, is expected to present a report on his latest working visit to the West African country at the summit of the heads of state. The heads of state and government will also receive a report on ECOWAS institutional reforms, single currency program, and a memorandum on the proposed mechanism of rotation of ECOWAS member states' candidature to the chairmanship of the African Union. The River State Governor, Mr. Gisum Wike, continued with the series of project commissioning to mark his sixth year in office with the inauguration of secondary school projects in the state. Located in Eleme and Oigbo local government areas, Governor Wiki says the projects are in fulfillment of his electioneering promises to the people of River State. He also spoke on the need for the federal government to revamp federal infrastructure, especially the East-West Road in River State. Sited on a 16,000 square meter of land in Eteo in Eleme local government area is the latest contribution of the Nyesom Wike administration in the education sector in River State. The 24 classroom story building with administrative offices, libraries, among other facilities is said to be part of an effort to increase access to quality secondary education. For the special guest, who is commissioning a second project in the state, Governor Nyesom Wike has made the PDP proud by raising the bar of governance in Nigeria. The number of brothers being extruded and commissioned by eminent personalities in River State is a testimony of the de uh, developmental activity, economic and social, being carried out by the governor of this state. Meanwhile, Governor Wike is using the opportunity to challenge the federal government to intervene in some critical federal infrastructure, which he says are in dire straits in River State. Like we said, we are not only focusing on roads, we are also focusing on health and we are also focusing on education. The Commissioner of Education did say this of course will improve access to quality education. The chairman of the PDP Board of Trustees then leads others to commission the school. 
After the commissioning of the secondary school in Eteo in Eleme local government area, Governor Wiki then leads the former deputy president of the Senate, Ibrahim Mantu, and other guests to commission a newly built secondary school with modern learning facilities in Obeakbondoki in Oigbo local government area. Like the chairman, PDP Board of Trustees, Governor Wiki is commended by Senator Mantu. Having seen and participated in, commis in commissioning these life-changing projects, we are now like Jehovah's Witnesses, witnesses of the great strides that the Wiki has taken to transform the lives of the Rivers people from poverty to prosperity. After three weeks of activities, the River State Government says more projects are to be commissioned, while others will be flagged off in the coming days to mark Governor Wiki's sixth year in office and expand infrastructure development in River State. Governor Nasser El Rafai of Kaduna State says the state government has started implementing the right sizing policy by disengaging 99 political appointees, but is yet to disengage any state civil servant. The governor explains that only agencies connected to the local government system have disengaged staff, and these include the 23 local government councils, suburb, and the primary health care board. He adds that the disengaged political appointees constitute 30% of political office holders in the state and that the right sizing of civil servants will still go on as planned because of the dwindling revenues in the state. And that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to Tenyola Shoboali who have her for business news. The Bureau of Public Enterprises has received over 100 projects that will be assessed for their viability for a public-private partnership. Speaking to Channels Television in Abuja, the Director General of the Bureau, Mr. Alex Oko, explains that the idea is to use private sector investments to bridge the infrastructure gap in the country. Some of the identified projects include rail, road, power, among others. Well, let's check in on the stock market now. Shares of Zenit Bank leads the bull rally, sustaining the positive sentiments for the third consecutive week in June. While well, Ekaite Afia has more. For the second consecutive day, the banking and consumer goods sectors of the NGX have helped to sustain the rebound and overall performance at the equities market. Let's take a look at the sectoral performance. Now, the trio of Zenith, FBNH, and Access Bank were the major pushers for their sector, despite the 0.68% drop in shares of UBA. Now, the market witnessed a pickup in activities as overall volume of transactions closed Friday's session higher at over 220 million units and almost 3,000 deals. Gauging the market's sentiments, more than 18 billion Naira is added to the market's overall value, which closed at 20.143 trillion Naira. Investors' interest is gradually picking up within the month of June, which ends the third trading week positive. However, with the dynamic nature of the market, fingers remain crossed as to what should be expected in the coming weeks, as investors look forward to the first half earnings scorecard from listed equities. That's all for the Stock Market Report. I'm Akaite Afia. And that's business news tonight. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Taniola. Still ahead on the news at 10, the European Union suffers setback in legal battle to force drug manufacturer AstraZeneca to supply 120 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine by end of June, plus other international news from our studio in London. Stay with us.
EU has lost a legal battle in Brussels to force drug maker AstraZeneca to supply 120 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine by the end of June. It's Simon Pusey with more international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Polls have opened in Iran for a controversial election that is all but guaranteed to deliver a hardline president after all other serious contenders were barred from the race. People are deciding who will succeed President Hassan Rouhani, with all but one of the four candidates regarded as hardliners. Opinion polls suggest Ebrahim Raisi, an ally of Hassan Rouhani, who currently heads the judiciary, is the clear favourite. Dissidents have called for a boycott, saying the barring of several contenders left Mr Raisi with no serious competition. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has said his country needed to prepare for both dialogue and confrontation with the U.S. It marks the first time Mr. Kim has directly commented on President Joe Biden's administration. He has said the country needed especially to get fully prepared for confrontation in order to protect the dignity of the state. The U.S. has been calling for North Korea to give up on its nuclear weapons. The UN says the number of people forced to flee their homes due to conflict, persecution and human rights abuses has doubled in the past decade. Nearly 70% of those affected are from just five countries, including South Sudan and Myanmar. The statistics are part of an annual report on forced displacement by the UN Refugee Agency. The total of 82 million people means that more than 1% of the world's population is currently displaced. I think this is very significant because we're talking about 2020. We're talking about the year of COVID-19, the year where we didn't move, where we were confined, locked down. Yet, in spite of that, there are three million people more that have been compelled to flee because of war. Meanwhile, authorities in Spain are searching for missing migrants after a dinghy carrying around 46 people capsized off Lanzarote Island. The accident resulted in the death of at least three of the passengers and Spanish Coast Guard are searching for five missing migrants. The number of undocumented migrants arriving in the Canary Islands has increased 116% compared to the same period in 2020. Streets have turned to rivers in Mexico's southern city of Juchitan after heavy rains lashed the region, causing a local river to flood homes. Todas las cosas están aquí tirado, pues. Authorities have reported that about a thousand homes are flooded. As waters slowly recede, local authorities and residents are coming together to clean up the streets and stop the spread of disease in the city. Further floods with heavy rain are predicted to go on until next week. A Liberian rebel commander has been found guilty by a Swiss court in the first ever war crimes conviction relating to the country's civil war. Alio Kosia was sentenced to 20 years for crimes including murder and rape. Around 250,000 people were killed in Liberia's civil wars in total. Russia is facing a sharp increase in the number of new COVID-19 infections while also hosting European Championship football matches. Moscow is now seeing infection numbers as high as December last year and hospital admissions in the capital are up 70% on last week. No Euro 2020 matches are taking place in Moscow itself, but a special fan zone with a big screen has now been closed. St. Petersburg, which is hosting six matches, is facing a steep rise in coronavirus cases too. And finally, a tightrope walker in America has crossed a college campus in the air, walking on a 320-foot log wire. I did. We signed her last night. Don't you remember? It is the longest high-wire walk ever undertaken in the city of Buffalo in the state of New York. And it's not Nick Wallender's first time either, having walked over Niagara Falls on a wire in a live televised event in 2012. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. The federal government has appointed former Super Eagles skipper John Mika Lubi as youth ambassador to inspire young Nigerians to strive for excellence. Minister of Youth and Sports Development Sunday Dari says it's part of government's initiative geared towards driving a vibrant youth for national development. About 77,500 fans will watch the international friendly between Nigeria and Mexico next month at the Los Angeles Coliseum after the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, announced the lift of COVID-19 restrictions in the state. 
The Super Eagles will take on Mexico in the United States on July the 3rd as they step up preparations for their World Cup qualifying campaign as well as next year's African Nations Cup in Cameroon. In the European Championships, Emil Forsberg's second-half penalty ensured Sweden take a huge step towards qualifying for the last 16 with victory against Slovakia in St. Petersburg. The Czech Republic took a huge step towards qualifying for the last 16 with an entertaining draw against Croatia at Hampden Park. England and Scotland settled for a goalless draw at Wembley. And that's Sports News. Thank you, Ayutunde. And the main news again. The Kebbi State government today said some of the students and teachers kidnapped from the federal government college, Benning Yawuri, in Kebbi State have been rescued, while one of the students is said to have been killed. There are also reports that more than 100 bandits may have been killed in the gun battle with the bandits. As you must attend tonight, thank you for watching. Stay with the channel's television for more updates. I'm Millicent Walker. Stay safe. Thank you.